I think we might switch over to the demo mode here and look at some of these models that you have in the book and talk about how they work and what they explain. Maybe we start with the uh, Lego bricks. So here we have a graph essentially of made of two by two Lego bricks. And the number of bricks starts out as zero. So we have an, a zero there and one and four and nine and 16. There's no significance to the stripes, except it makes it a little easier to count and see what's going on. And so that happens to be the number of Lego bricks is the square of where they are on that plate there. Now, suppose we want to know the difference between subsequent sets of bricks. So we could fill in there. So the difference between zero and one is one and difference between one and four is three and so on, five and then seven. So we were going to say, okay, how is that? How much has that changed? So that's straightforward, right? And so we say, suppose we made our own another little curve, taking those those bricks there and putting them on. So difference between those two is one. So the one here, for example, was the difference between zero and one. So I'm putting it between those two. Right. Okay. So that is that curve in the front shows how the curve in the back is changing. So the curve in the back is changing faster as we go along the curve. Its rate of change is changing. So it happens to be a straight line with a slope of two. And you could prove that to yourself. And so that curve is called the derivative. The blue curve is called the derivative of the pink one. And that is the first major thing you learn to do in calculus is computing those derivatives. Mm -hmm. But basically all you're doing is saying, how are things changing? And if we made a curve of how things are changing, over when it's no longer a constant, what does that look like? So it's a generalized version of slope. If you think of the slope of a straight line, it's changing in a regular way. Now, there's an interesting property of this that is called the fundamental theorem of calculus, usually all caps and all that good stuff, but it's not all that complicated. So suppose we say, could we somehow get that pink curve from the blue one? Well, you can actually, because if you start adding up the changes that you made as you go, you'll end up with the original curve. It's this column is the same height as this one. And if I take that and add it to the second one, now I've got four, that's the same height as this. This four, I can add it to five, I get nine, which is the same as that. If I take all of that and add it to the next one, I get 16. And what we're really doing, if you think about it, is we get adding up the area under that original curve, and that's called an integral. And the fact that if you add up the area underneath the derivative curve, you get an integral back. We get the original curve back. It's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so that's your first semester of calculus right there. There are a lot of ifs and ands and buts in calculus, which always makes it a little bit challenging. But for getting the fundamental concept here, we have exercises in our early chapters where the answers are photographs of little Lego brick constructions like this instead of giant lists of numbers to the odd number problems or something. We found that when you actually go in and work with the bricks and play with them, that you get a tremendous amount of insight that you don't get if you just are chugging through numbers and saying this formula is a simple formula for this kind of a relationship. So what? This gives you the insight and then you can translate it to other things. We've also have the curves. You have the blue right angle model there. Uh, this model works for simple things where all the, uh, all the heights of our columns in here work out to integers. It's difficult to have non-integer numbers of Lego bricks, of course, and you're limited to the resolution of the Lego bricks. So you can't necessarily see what it's doing in between these. So create continuous curves to represent the same information. We have 3D prints and this one is designed to match the Lego bricks. So it's tracking the height of those stacks of Lego bricks as we go. And then it has this other side, which matches this. And so you can go back and forth between a curve and how it changes and the changes added up to get the original curve by flipping it and thinking about and understanding that those two things are inverses of each other, like addition and subtraction. And so that's a very visceral way to get some sense of doing it. And it's fun for uh, sinusoids if you have a sine wave. Briefly, the part of the reason for putting these perpendicular to one another, as we have here, is one thing that, that made it difficult for me to understand uh, a lot of the graphs of this is 
when you we actually use derivatives and like be talking about say the the speed that a car is going versus how far it's gone a lot of the Practical examples presented in calculus involve relating a car's speedometer to its odometer and stuff like that. But if you think about it, the speedometer and odometer are measuring different things. One is measuring speed and one is measuring distance. And so putting those on the same axis of the graph is confusing. It's misleading. And so the in this case, the time axis would be shared on both. But you have one axis measuring distance and the other is measuring speed. And so those need, they're different dimensions. They need to be separated like that. And so we have this model. We have some other variations on this as well. Uh, which I was mentioning sinusoid. So you have a sine curve. Its, its changes are a cosine. Those changes happen to be a negative sine. Those changes happen to be a negative cosine. And if you want to add up the changes underneath it, you would turn it the other way. And this also gives you some insights into electromagnetic waves, which have a magnetic and electric field that are propagating at right angles to each other. And they have some interesting relationships that are related to these calculus relationships. So there's physicists don't want to give this one back if we let them see it and want to play with it for a while. So this physicality we find is a really powerful thing to, to think about. The other interesting critique we got from somebody was these can't be math because they're too beautiful. And that just offended me. We said, math is beautiful, so what's your problem? And and all of that. You can also have some, you asked about practical applications. So maybe Lockyer Volterra models here. So the Lockyer Volterra equations are about something that consumes something else over time. So they apply to rabbits and foxes in fields. The foxes eat the rabbits. They also apply to a lot of chemical interaction and just tons and tons of things. It's two differential equations that are coupled. What you're looking at here is, uh, is how the rabbits in this situation change over time. And the way we've designed this is that we look at, uh, at 90 degrees, um, we can look at how the foxes change over time because if there's more rabbits, you can have more foxes. And then if the foxes overeat and kill off too many rabbits, they start to starve. And so it goes around and around. And one of the things we had solved for this was to think about, and this is where our visually impaired um, folks were very helpful, is how to think about how do you want to represent three things? You have a 3D print, so you should be able to have a 3D graph. And so this represents times, time rabbit and foxes in this case. And we had to play with that quite a bit and experiment quite a bit to get something that was clean to think about. And Rich has an earlier version just because this is make, and so you have to talk about iterating and trying things, right? Our first version of this model was, was this which had a few problems with it. If you look at this shape, you have to you look at it down from the end. You have this egg shaped, it's actually a triangle, a rounded triangle that you get in this, in this helical pattern going down the model. And because the, as the rabbit population increases first, and then the box population increases in response to it, which crashes the rat population and the, uh, box population crashes again in response to that. And the, process starts over. So the process of doing this is based on at each time step, you take tiny steps through time going this direction. And each step, you look at the values in that step to find the values for the next step and you find the values for the next step. So if your steps are too big, you get what's called numerical drift. And so this model, we started down at the bottom here and this started getting bigger and bigger as it went up the spiral because we were getting numerical drift. Our each answer was a little bit off because our time step was too big. And you can also see segmentation along this because of the size of those time steps. So we increased the, uh, the sampling rate. We used smaller time steps to generate this. That helped. The other problem with this is it's hard to orient. Does it go this way? Does it go this way? Where's zero? So I know by uh, looking at it now that zero would be somewhere around here, but that's not indicated on the model anywhere. And if I'm holding it this way, I might think that zero is over here and that would be wrong. So this shows you where things are relative to the previous time step, but it doesn't show you the absolute value of things. You have to be able to see where zero is, you know, this is the higher value and it's not going negative over here. It's just getting small and stuff like that. So. Something that's hard, that, that's hard to visualize also from the math. And one thing that's nice is that in OpenSCAD, even if you didn't have a 3D printer, you could still change some of these numbers see how things changed 
and uh, look at this projection like you're looking at now on a screen. It's more powerful to see them in person, but it's not terrible to see them on a screen also. And actually, if you go on Wikipedia and look up the logical voltaire equations, you'll see this graph. And you'll see this graph and they're on the same axis. So it's hard to tell that they're attracting quantities of different things. And they probably use colors for that, which yeah, is better than nothing. You'll also see this shape, this triangular circular thing that it makes. And it's hard to see how those actually relate to one another when they're on two separate graphs that don't have the same axis one another. But when they're coming out of the same shape and this 3D shape, and you just look at it from different directions to see these shapes, it's a lot, a lot more visceral how they're related. We also created this model, which goes along with it. This shows the same data represented, most of the same data represented in a different way. We're no longer tracking time. This is called a phase space model. You can look at these next to each other. And we see the same shape and it turns out that these, you can see these shapes on this and they're different heights. And so if you, if you start out with different starting values, different starting numbers of rabbits and foxes, you end up at a different place on this. And wherever you start out, you circle around at the same height. And so if you happen to start out right here at the peak of this model, that's called a stable point and the numbers of rabbits and foxes won't vary. They'll stay constant. In this modeling exercise, is that different phenomena may be represented in similar ways and mm -hmm. see different pattern, detect different patterns in nature or whatever we're talking about here, or just numbers even. Yeah, we have a little chapter on uh, as part of a chapter on numerical mo on modeling. You have an unknown phenomena and what does it look like? And a lot of what a scientist does is to say, I think it should vary about this. And they come up with a mathematical model. How much do you believe your model? And does it look like something that's been solved already? And so it may not be exactly right, but you might be able to get started. And many of these classical equations are used for many things. And if you have a sense of this one, then you can go in and vary it and change it and play around with your own data to try to understand it and within the limitations of the assumptions that we have here. So we've tried to spell out the assumptions and what you can do with it. So if somebody is doing something else, that maybe they can mess around with it, add some terms and do that kind right. of stuff. When you can translate that into open SCAD, you can use that tool over and over again to create different variations. And there's an open source GitHub repository of the models so people can, and we hope they will, yeah. take them and fork them and do cool stuff with them.